On the night of November the 4th, I was called by a man I'd never heard of and asked if I would go down to Jonestown, Guyana. I was asked because I was the only person who they felt could mediate between Leo Ryan and Jim Jones and the people who wanted to leave Jonestown. I was asked because I was the only defector who had ever left People's Temple who still maintained communication with the Joneses. It was a very difficult decision for me to make because I knew I might never come back to the United States alive. On the night that Leo Ryan started towards Jonestown, I was in Georgetown, Guyana. I received a call from Jim Jones on the ham radio saying, send my daughter Bonnie out to Jonestown tomorrow morning. And so I prayed and I said, God, you said if we ask for wisdom that you would give it to us. What should I do? And I knew that I should stay. The FBI later told me, along with some of the defectors that were there, that I had been set up by Jim Jones, the man who called me his daughter, to be killed by two guards as soon as I got off the plane in Port Kaituma. Today in the United States, we have a problem which can only be described as a cult explosion. We have a mass of individuals between 25 and 30 million functioning here in America on the periphery of Christianity. They have their own liturgy, they have their own extra biblical revelations, their own leaders, their own revelations, and they make copious use of the Bible, most always out of context. One day I was at the LA airport and a girl sold me a book about Krishna and I read it. And eventually after that I ended up leaving my husband and joining a rock and roll band that never formulated. But the leader of the group was into Krishna and he brought me to the Berkeley Temple and that's where I first joined the Krishnas. The Christian people that I had seen were all uh, sitting in church and uh, weren't doing very much. So consequently, I started really looking for uh, uh, people who were doing something. And this led me eventually to uh, my associations with the Manson family. I became a part of People's Temple and called myself a communist because as I looked at the church and I looked at the hypocrisy and I looked at the Christians, who white Christians who wouldn't sit with black Christians, I began to see more of what I thought Christianity was in people's temple. 78% of cultic systems are made up of people that were previously in Christianity, whether they were Orthodox, Catholic, or Protestant. The cults do not proselytize the unchurched generally. What they do is go to those who have some religious foundation and then attempt to build their foundation on top of that. A good friend of mine in New York City, who was a drug dealer at the time, told me about Scientology. I was skeptical at first, but my eyes began to open to the fact that there was supernatural power available in life. In New York City, I studied auditing at the Central Organization. An auditor in Scientology is someone who counsels people and encourages them to break through the barriers of their mind. I'm a person who was involved in the inside of it for about six or seven years. Well, when my son got into Scientology, I had never heard of it before. And at first I thought, wow, this is another weird thing. But they don't believe in drugs, and that was my main worry about my son anyway. And like, he became a, a better person through it. And I started going along with it, thinking, wow, whatever it is, it's good. Christian Science is a religion that was founded by Mary Baker Eddy in 1866 in Boston, Massachusetts. I was a third generation Christian scientist. I attended a Christian Science High School, Principia, and also went to their college. Unity started back in the late 1800s by Charles and Myrtle Fillmore. They were originally followers of Mary Baker Eddy and Christian Science. They felt they were taking the best of many religions and forming them into this new movement. The appeal of the black Muslim organization was in its militant confrontation with the white establishment and with the black middle class leadership which we had in the United States at that time. 
the single most uh, powerful and effective uh, criticism which the uh, black Muslims used to make against Christianity was, uh, first of all, to identify the white man as the devil, and then to identify Christianity as the white man's religion. The special appeal of the Worldwide Church of God to me was that the organization represented a freedom from fear, a freedom from the possibility that if you stumble, you're going to go burn forever. I went to Ambassador College in 1961 and graduated there in 1965. I went to Ambassador to start their data processing center, and I, was, uh, I worked in that particular department through about 1973. I was an editor of publications for Ambassador College and the Worldwide Church of God for 12 and a half years. As an employee there, I worked on the Plain Truth magazine, Good News, booklets, and doctrinal papers. I was a member of the Worldwide Church of God, founded by Herbert Armstrong for 10 years. I attended his college for three years, worked in two different offices on the campus, and married an Ambassador College graduate. My mother sincerely decided that she wanted to become a member of the Worldwide Church of God. And in order to become a member at that time, which was back in about 1955, she was required to leave my father. And at the age of 10, I lost my father to the Worldwide Church of God. She spent hours on her knees crying and praying in order to, for God to give her the strength to do this. She'd been married to my father for 12 years, and they had a happy marriage. Shortly after that, she married the youngest brother of Herbert Armstrong, Dwight Armstrong. I believe that there were two major attractions for people to come into and be part of the Worldwide Church of God. Number one, they were not finding the fulfillment and meaning in the traditional churches. And number two, there was a lot of fear of the end of the world. They taught that in 1972, in fact, January 7th to be exact, the entire nation, the United States, British Commonwealth nations were going to be attacked by Germany and the United Europe and we we're going to have our entire nation go down in flames. And we believed it. In order to escape, one had to be part of the Worldwide Church of God. Armstrong has always been talking about the end of the world. The Jehovah's Witnesses have been talking about the end of the world since 1889 and uh, they predicted it first in 1914, and they have consistently missed it ever since. In 1914, 1918, 1925, and their very latest prediction, 1975, they predicted the end of the world. And I was a Jehovah Witness for five years, my wife, all my five children, and we were full-time pioneers. That, uh, that means that you put in 100 hours a month going door to door, in 1940, a knock came at our door, and it wasn't uh, but a very short time after that that my mother and I began attending uh, the local Kingdom Hall. And for a 10-year period, we were involved as Jehovah's Witnesses. I have been involved in teaching in the Department of History in a college, and I also have been teaching in the area of the religions of America. I also have written three books on the Witnesses, I spent 19 years in the Mormon Church. I was a member of the Holy Melchizedek Priesthood, a Temple Mormon. I did missionary work. I performed every function ever given to me, held as many as six jobs at one time. I was a Mormon for 30 years. I was raised my younger years in Utah. My ancestors crossed the plains in 1865 with handcarts. I started teaching in the Mormon Church when I was 17 years old. I've taught in all the auxiliaries, including three years as a genealogical teacher. When I was in college, I came home one afternoon after class, and there were these two little Mormon missionaries at my apartment. When the missionaries first came to my house, I had this, this feeling that those people loved me. They came in and took my children by the hand and sat down and played with them. They invited my wife and me to potluck dinners. They were there all the time. When I ran across these missionaries, these elders, I expected some white-haired old gentleman to meet with me and he turned out to be a year younger than me. I had a testimony of Mormonism. I knew that Joseph Smith was a prophet. I believed the Book of Mormon to be the Word of God. I believed that there was a prophet on this earth today. 
but I really investigated, I prayed about it, and I believe with all my heart that it was the true church. These two young men came to me, and they said that they represented the only true church. I didn't know that at the time, that there are many, many people running around saying, we are the only true church. If I believe that the Christian was really the lost person, I believe that even though you, you worship my God, you did a rather bad job of it, that you were not really skilled in knowing how to interpret God's law, because you only had one book to work with. You had the Holy Bible. What we relied upon was a series of Mormon scriptures, the Book of Mormon, the Pearl of Great Price, and the Doctrine and Covenants. In there, God truly revealed his word to man. The great danger, I think, in Scientology or in any other cult is the fact that all of the cultists believe that theirs is the only way. I really felt proud to be a Christian scientist. I was taught that we had the highest revelation, higher even than the Gospels, and that other religions were nice, but they would eventually find the full and complete truth. The Jehovah's Witnesses believe that the 144,000 are the only ones who can really interpret the Bible. We also believe that all other uh, religions and churches uh, were of the devil. Any people outside of the Worldwide Church of God were considered to be pagans and heathen and totally outside of, of God. They could not possibly be Christians. And that he and his beliefs alone are the true gospel that Jesus brought to this earth. The authority in the Christian Science Church comes directly from Mary Baker Eddy through her authorized writings and through the manual of the Mother Church. She also said in her writings that it never even mattered to her whether Jesus ever walked the earth. We used to call the Bible the poison book. And Elijah Muhammad used to say that the Bible was the graveyard and that the Negro was buried in the Bible. I saw Jim Jones go up on the pulpit, throw the Bible on the floor, shake his fist in God's face and say, X you God, if God is there, then smite me dead. You can spot trouble by the man who comes and says, I alone represent God. Herbert Armstrong said that no man had any right to question anything he did, that he reported only to God. Herbert Armstrong is undisputed leader, is considered an apostle, in fact, the only representative of God on earth. No church member was ever allowed to question his use of funds, his doctrines, his use of his own power, anything he did. He was, in fact, above the law. How can a small, relatively unknown church afford such luxurious surroundings? Enter the doctrine of tithing. Financially, they want 30% or 40 or more of your income. In your personal life, they approve whom you marry. They do not allow you to go to doctors, even if it's a terminal illness or a very simply performed operation like appendicitis. The personal control of your life goes down to makeup, the clothes you wear, the length of your skirt, the length of your hair, the presence of television in your home, which movies you go to, and the list goes on and on. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It just goes on and on and on. The kind of food you can eat, the kind of clothes you can buy. You could not buy socks that were mixed wool and cotton or wool and nylon. If there was anything threatening to them, it was individuality, and they stifled it completely. As a director of data processing, I had all the computerized information, including the mailing lists and donation histories. And I was asked on numerous occasions by many ministers, including Herbert Armstrong, to run tithe checks to guarantee that certain members were tithing correctly. The wealth in Herbert Armstrong's home was indescribable. Oil paintings on every wall, every available space. China on his table that was owned by the Tsar of Russia. He had a set of salt and pepper shakers on his table that he was very proud that cost $12,000. Kids didn't get their teeth fixed. They were driving 1953 Chevys, wearing old suits that were worn out, but they were sending their money to Herbert because they had a fierce belief that that's what God wanted them to do. A leader who has a dynamic approach to his people. He slowly but surely conditions them, isolates them from their family and from all of their contacts. Then he begins to erode their financial basis so they become dependent upon him. And then finally, he becomes, in effect, their pivotal point of worship. 
and they'll follow him any place. We found ourselves seduced more and more by Jim Jones's undermining of all of the things that we had held sacred. And we found them replaced with new beliefs. People in the congregation, including myself, signed legal affidavits, which were tests of our, quote, loyalty, in which I would say, I, Bonnie Burnham, would kill, destroy, or commit, commit any act necessary to establish communistic rule under Jim Jones. And the people at Jonestown were just normal human beings who underwent the alteration of personality. And this can happen in many cultic structures. All power was in the hands of Elijah Muhammad. And on local levels, this gave uh, the Muslim ministers a dictatorial power over the minds of the congregations. And in this way, he was able to get them to do anything that he wanted them to do. And if you uh, did question the authority, then you were faced with uh, immediate discipline. When I first joined the temple, I thought that we would spend a lot of time just uh, praying and chanting and meditating on the Lord. And after I'd been in it for just a little while, maybe a few weeks, I found that the emphasis was actually on going out in the streets and collecting money and giving out books. They taught us how to uh, take as much money as we possibly could from people, how to uh, shortchange people. As soon as they had me indoctr indoctrinated, they sent me out fundraising. And I never even realized that a lot of things that I was saying to people all over the place, in, in San Francisco and in Los Angeles, wherever they sent me on any kind of mission, that I was outright lying to people. And they would just say, oh, it's OK, you're not really lying. It's, it's, heavenly deception. Why they get you into the church working like a beaver for Sun Myung Moon, raising funds and promoting what he says is true. And they would even lure us into believing that each carnation or each rose that you sold to somebody would be in a sense their ticket to heaven. And Time Magazine quoted Moon as saying that he is their brain. I believed it. I totally believed it. I was, I was like a walking robot. I believed everything they said. I woke up about three or three thirty in the morning and usually had to be dragged out of bed because I was so tired. The day began with a cold shower and dressing in uh, the traditional sari. We would go to the morning service. There we would chant and dance in front of the deities. We were told that the deities in the temple were deities in the presence of Krishna actually dwelled there. But actually when it comes right down to it, they were an idol. My day was finished at uh, about 11 o'clock at night, and I would go back to the ashram and take rest and get up again at 3.30. And I would do anything I could to sell those flowers. And it, it wasn't even me. Now that I look back, I was, just, I was just being driven to do this to support this community, which I thought was life. The challenge that faces us today is to reach out to people like this and to contrast the other Jesus, the other spirit, the other gospel with the word of God. In Mormonism, what I was taught was that God the Father, who's a physical man with a body of flesh and bones, probably about six feet tall, and lives on a place called Kolob, had sexual relations with one of his wives, probably his senior wife, and that brought forth the spirit of Jesus Christ in the preexistence. This Jesus had a second brother by the name of Lucifer, and there was an argument about who was going to be the savior. Jesus presented one plan, and Lucifer, who became the devil, presented another plan. Jesus' plan won. Lucifer was cast out of heaven and rebelled. The same Jesus came down to earth to be the savior, as they call him, and he was brought forth from Mary by sexual relations between God the Father. Remember, he's a man and has a physical body. And uh, when Jesus was a minister on the earth, he taught the gospel according to Mormonism that you become gods yourselves by eternal progression. When he died on the cross of Calvary, he paid only for Adam's transgression. Adam's transgression brought on physical death. The sacrifice of Jesus Christ brings on physical life. Eternal life, which is godhood in Mormonism, is earned totally through your own works. This is the Jesus of Mormonism. 
And as you go further into Mormonism, you find that it is polytheistic. There are many gods, and every Mormon male in the priesthood has an opportunity to reach that third level of the celestial heaven where he too may become a polygamous god for all eternity. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Jesus, prior to coming to earth, instead of him being God, he was Michael the Archangel. We believe that uh, Jehovah God was uh, all alone in time past, and his first creative act was to create Jesus. In other words, Jesus is a created God, a second God. So the Jehovah's Witnesses have two gods for all their talk about Jehovah and one God. Christian science teaches that there's a distinction between Jesus and the Christ. They teach that Jesus is just a man who, more than other men, expressed the Christ's truth. It teaches that we, too, can evolve and progress to be just like Jesus. They teach that Jesus is gone now, but the Christ idea is still with us. The Unity teaching says that God is an impersonal God, that God does not love, but God is love, and that love exists in everyone and everything. Christ is a divine idea or divine principle. Everyone becomes more godly as they become aware of that Christ principle in themselves. That is the Christ consciousness. And you find out that Jesus is just a man with a Christ consciousness. And that Christ consciousness is shared by all of us. Jesus only had it in a greater degree than we possess it. If you talk to the Jesus of Sun Myung Moon's Unification Church, you are talking to a Lord of the Second Advent who returned to Korea in early 1920s. Obviously, Sun Myung Moon himself. I was going, well, wait a second. If Reverend Sun Myung Moon's the Messiah, then who's Jesus? But Jesus is the Messiah. And I was going back and forth and back and forth. The followers of Charlie Manson, the other members of the family, believed that in his divinity, believed he was the Messiah, or that there was a good possibility. Jim Jones claimed to be the incarnation of Jesus Christ. One of the things I remembered that he would use at the climax of our meetings was the stigmata of Christ, where he would hold up his palms and blood would stream from his palms. We must never forget that when you talk about Jesus Christ or salvation, the vocabulary is entirely different. You must never, ever make the mistake of assuming that you are talking the same language. Jesus, to a Scientologist, is just some person or just some teacher from the past. He's not a living reality. The name Jesus was not even used and is not even used. He is merely known as Christ. And they would strip uh, Jesus of any divine uh, nature attribute and uh, boil him down to an everyday white man and then uh, say, look what you're doing, you're worshiping uh, this white devil. The Jesus of the cults is not the Jesus of the Bible. He's another Jesus. And the way you find out is to contrast the Jesus that they talk about with the Jesus revealed in Scripture. The first wave of cults consists of the ones that most people are probably familiar with, the older ones, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Mormons, and so forth. However, in recent years, we've experienced a newer wave, consisting primarily of spiritual teachings, philosophies, and occult practices imported from the East. More recently yet, we have experienced an even newer wave, which seems to consist of a combination of these Eastern practices and teachings put into Western packaging. A few years ago, the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi came to the West from his Himalayan cave, where he had been practicing and teaching meditation, and he brought this transcendental meditation to the West as the highest form of spirituality. But then the Maharishi changed his mind, and instead of calling it the spiritual regeneration movement, as he did at the beginning, started calling it a science. My initial involvement in transcendental meditation began because I was seeking to understand the meaning of life without having to deal with God. And the people in TM promised in their propaganda that uh, this was not a religion and it wasn't even spiritual. Maharishi used to say you didn't even have to believe it worked for it to work. That was very appealing to me. As a teacher of Transcendental Meditation, we were told to um, 
well lie about what TM is to the public. So we were told to misrepresent TM and to present it as a simple scientific technique of relaxation. When in reality, what they were doing was, was taking a, a rocket ship into another state of consciousness, which ultimately would transform their whole view of reality and ultimately their whole view of God. I spent a month studying with the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi and then began to realize that what I was involved in was actually Hinduism. I'm just amazed that so many millions of Westerners do not realize that Transcendental Meditation, TM, is a Hindu cult. We are dealing here with just pure, old-fashioned Hinduism dressed up in Western terminology and Western gear to make it palatable to the Western mind. And they can't reach the Western mind by giving them the religion of India. India is one of the most suffering countries in the world. And I know for a fact that the majority of social problems in India have their roots in Hindu religion and Hindu philosophy. When I first got into Transcendental Meditation, I observed some superficial benefits, uh, such as relaxation, a general heightening of a sort of euphoric feeling that would come and go, and certain stressful feelings, which the teachers of TM told me were, was called unstressing, releasing stress from the nervous system. Uh, I became a teacher of it after going to Fuji, Italy, to study with the Maharishi and about 2,000 of us from all over the world. I was born and raised a Hindu. I descended from a long line of Brahmin priests. After I reached the age of about seven, I started living in a Hindu temple and uh, learning from the Hindu holy men, from the yogis. I studied Hinduism, I practiced it, and I even taught it. Hinduism teaches basically that the universe is divine. All is divine. Man's goal is to realize that he is divine, that he is God and one with the universe. Krishna teaches in the Bhagavad Gita that the way to achieve this goal of self-realization is through yoga. And the real heart of yoga is not physical exercises, but meditation. And I know for a fact that transcendental meditation is not a science, but rather a religion, a form of Hinduism. The mantra which is given is not a meaningless sound, as Maharishi has said it is. It is the name of a Hindu deity. Once when I was on an acid trip, some voices began speaking to me and telling me about the Om, which is a Hindu mantra that's supposed to be the universal vibration. And these voices instructed me to repeat Om, to chant Om, or just simply to tune into Om by listening and that if I did so, I would become one with cosmic consciousness. I was amazed to find out that the things that the voices had taught me when I'd taken LSD were actually the teachings of Hinduism. Normally, a person will sit down for 20 minutes a day, twice a day, and silently repeat a mantra, which is a word in Sanskrit, which is the uh, Hindu holy language. They tell us that Krishna is everything and that all things come from him. And we would chant his name in the form of the Hare Krishna mantra. After I got into Hinduism, I quit taking drugs. I got a lot more stone meditating than I ever had on LSD. Many people would come into TM as a Christian or a Jew or whatever, and they would be completely, by the time several years had gone by, they would be a Hindu. Um, many of them were so deceived that they didn't even realize that they had made this transition. But uh, when you talk to them, their whole view of reality and of God and of who they were in relation to God, um, they believe that they were becoming God. This is a Hindu belief, not a Christian belief. When all things are said and done, the inevitable conflict is between Christianity and Hinduism because Hinduism absorbs all other religions. It just blew me away when, when he told me that my purpose for being on this earth was to become just like God himself. 
that I and my wife and possibly a few other wives would get our own planet someday, have celestial sexual relations, produce spirit children, and they'd start the whole cycle all over again with another Jesus and another Lucifer and a fall and a redemption. And I really believed that I was going to become a god. And why not? It is biblical. After all, that's what the serpent told Eve in Genesis chapter 3. I believed that, that I could become a god too. And that's what I strove for every day of my life. If you really want to get to the bottom of all of this stuff, you have to go back to the beginning to understand it, literally to the beginning of the Bible, the third chapter of Genesis, to the story of the fall of humanity in the Garden of Eden. The promise that the serpent made to Eve was that her eyes would be open and she would be as God. When I was in the Krishna consciousness movement, I was subject to the bondage that they want us all to live under, especially as a woman. I had to be submissive to my authorities and then take another birth maybe in my next life as a man and come back and do the whole thing over again and become pure. Also, Scientology does not believe that it's appointed unto a man once to die. They don't think that they have to deal with themselves and their problems in one lifetime. They feel they're born again and again in reincarnation. Unity believes in reincarnation. Um, later, as a psychic, I used to give what were called life readings to people, readings about their past lives. So this very easily tied in. Jim Jones believed in reincarnation. And the first evening I was back with he and his wife, and we were sitting around in the living room. He said, Bonnie, it's so good to have you back home with us. You know that you were our daughter in many lifetimes. In the course of going through Scientology, one gains a lot of spiritual abilities and is able to do a kind of spiritual trick. This is called exteriorizing. Now, in exteriorizing, what happens is the person gets freed of the bondage of his body and can look down at his body from outside of his body or from above his body. I had what's called an out-of-body experience where I felt like my soul was leaving my body and I was looking at myself sitting down on the bed. And that frightened me because I was told that TM was not spiritual and yet here I was having a spiritual experience as a result of it. One time I even astrally projected or exteriorized, if you will, from my body in New Jersey all the way to Yankee Stadium in New York City. And coming back into my body in New Jersey, I was wondering if I, what I had seen was the truth. And the next day I called up the Daily News in New York and asked them what had transpired in New York City in Yankee Stadium. And the story they told me was exactly what I recorded in my astral projection. The more I meditated, the more I experienced the mystical world. I used to be ushered into the other worlds, having visions of the various gods and hearing mystical music, experiencing out-of-body travels, astral projection. I had uh, a lot of experiences which were uh, supernatural experiences. Definitely, uh, it was not my mind imagining these things because I didn't believe, necessarily believe in these things that they were possible to happen to somebody until I experienced it myself. So I frequently experienced the presence of spirit sitting on either side of me as I meditated. Once during a teacher training course, during the night I experienced the presence of a spirit trying to enter and take possession of my whole being. It was very frightening. I now know that it was a demon. A few strange things did happen while I was in class instruction. Our teacher told us they might happen and called it chemicalization or a reaction to the so-called truth that we were learning. Unity was the only foundation I had for any kind of spiritual teaching. This eventually led me into an involvement with psychic phenomena. Often as a psychic, um, I would see apparitions around people. Um, these were what we believed spirit guides, that every person had uh, a group of spiritual entities around them were sort of guiding their lives. It was not an uncommon experience for people to have visitations from familiar spirits as they worked on their genealogy are questioned whether the church was true. These spirits would come to them in the appearance of a dead ancestor, a grandmother or an aunt, would tell them 
that the Mormon church was true and then give them some information about the genealogy work that they were involved in. They would leave a trinket or something that would identify their visits. These spirits would communicate to them and then leave. I did not have what Mormons call a testimony, and this is very important. It's a physical sensation. You pray and ask the Lord to give you a testimony to the truthfulness of the church. And one Saturday afternoon, I went into a corner by myself, and I sat there looking out the window, and I noticed this speck of light, and it came closer. And as it came closer to me, it got larger, and I could see that there was a figure in the light. And finally, it stopped just outside the window, and the figure was life-size, and it was my great-grandmother. And grandmother had been dead for five years. She was just as real as she had ever been. She looked like grandmother. She sounded like grandmother. She told me she was there in answer to my prayer about the church, that she was there to reassure me that Joseph Smith was a true prophet called of God. The church was the true church containing the restored gospel, and that regardless of what my family or friends or anyone else said, I was to stay in the church, I was to stay active, and to begin doing my genealogy work because she had accepted the gospel in the spirit world. I was meditating with a friend of mine in his home. We were extremely high, and I was trying to enter into the seventh level of consciousness, which is also known as samadhi, or Zen Buddhists call it satori. It's kind of the same thing. It's where you supposedly become God. It's also known as God consciousness, where a man is supposed to achieve divinity through self-realization. As I came nearer and nearer to this level of consciousness, I was confronted with the decision. I had to surrender my whole being to a force that was rising up inside of me. As I opened myself up, I entered into a, a vast field of white light and energy, and I began to merge with the cosmic force. And something kind of unusual happened at that point. I saw that everything was an illusion, at least that's what I thought I saw. The Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, who has brought TM to the West, teaches that this universe is just maya. It's all illusion. Evil is unreal. Nothing claiming to be something, a delusion of the senses. This visible universe is supposed to be but a counterfeit of the real spiritual universe. And the existence that we're in is just a dream. By taking medicine, you would be acknowledging the reality of disease. I had reached uh, one of the ultimate states of Scientology, which was called clear. And being a clear somehow didn't give me that deep, inner, intimate warmth that I craved. And I began to walk around the streets of San Francisco trying to get through that coldness and that iciness within my heart. TM also was making me feel much more empty. It, you go way inside yourself and you can become tremendously lonely. I had all the religious experiences that any religious aspirant could hope to have. But yet deep within my own heart, there was a marked emptiness. I felt lonely. There was a spiritual vacuum that no amount of meditation or yoga could fill. No amount of worshiping of the gods could seem to satisfy. I was so frustrated that I thought if I hadn't found the truth, I would, com I would commit suicide. Yet. I knew that suicide wasn't going to solve my basic fundamental spiritual problems. I myself could give psychic readings to somebody about how to take care of situations in his life, and yet my own life was going right down the tubes. I had nothing to look forward to but an eternity of struggling to progress till I was perfect. The pressure upon a person to just be perfect, to be a perfect person. The dilemma was that in Hinduism there is no forgiveness of sins. No matter how many times one says he is sorry, there is no forgiveness because of the Hindu doctrine of karma, which means the law of cause and effect. What a man sows, that he reaps. I had to find some kind of an alternative hope in life. And so I desired that if I had to come back to this earth, I would want to come back as a 
holy cow. And in order to attain this goal, every morning I stood up in front of a real live cow and worshipped the cow for one whole hour until one glorious morning while standing in front of holy cow, deep in meditation with flower in hand, out of the blue, holy cow charged at me. I had to run for my life. There were a lot of things in the philosophy that after I began to think about them, they didn't make sense. I'm Thelma Gear, fourth generation Mormon. My great grandfather, John D. Lee, was one of Brigham Young's adopted sons. Grandpa Lee had 19 wives and 64 children. He was one of the pioneers who went into Utah. He was a bodyguard for Brigham Young and for Joseph Smith. Everywhere I go, people say to me, but Mormons are such good moral people. They take care of their own, and they don't have anybody on welfare. I have found that in Utah, the land of the Latter-day Saints, there are more people on welfare, perhaps, than in any other state, according to the population. The divorce rate is among the highest. The Mormon Church, with all their publicity and ads, want to give you the impression that they have all the answers to the perfect family. Yet myself and many of my peers have experienced being told by our bishop to divorce our husbands because they were not living the standards of the church. I always felt sure in my heart that my husband was going to become a Mormon someday, and we would be sealed in the temple for time and eternity. When he became a born-again believer, he threatened my entire exaltation, and I was in trouble because he told me he would never become Mormon. I went to my bishop, and he told me I had three choices. First of all, I could divorce my husband. Secondly, I could remain married to my husband, stay in the church, be active, bring our children up in the church, and at the time of my death, become a servant or an angel for eternity. Thirdly, I could remain married to my husband, stay active in the church, bring my children up in the church, and at the time of my death, be vicariously sealed to another man in the temple as his second wife. Our children would be sealed to him, and it would be as if my husband never existed. This is what I decided to do. I'm a great granddaughter of Brigham Young and his second wife, Mary Ann Angel. I was raised a Mormon. I was active in the Mormon church for the first 40 years of my life. And when the Mormon church, which at this time I believed was the only true church, denied my son the privilege of being baptized and receiving the priesthood and going into the classes with the children his own age, it was just almost more than I could bear. For every pain that a retarded son goes through, the mother suffers even more so. I made up my mind right then and there. I would never take my son back into a church where the door was shut in his face. It seems that the Mormons do not want second-class citizens. Many of us were becoming very disillusioned with the church's doctrines, mainly because more and more we began to see that they were not working for us in actual practice. They were not proving to be to produce happiness and the, and the results that we wanted in our lives. Plus the fact that we began to observe more and more that our leaders, the ministers, were really not keeping them either. These ministers would watch over and encourage other laity to rat on you. And if anybody caught you going into the wrong movie or caught you doing anything they felt was wrong, they would run and tell the minister, then the minister would call you in and chew you out. I felt that if, as a church, this church could not keep its own backyard cleaned up, then what business did they have telling everybody else how to live their lives? I began to cry out to God that there must be something more than just this organization, that it was not giving me the peace and the security that I desperately needed in my life. Believe it or not, I still thought it was the true one true church of God on earth because I'd been taught that all of my life. And I wondered at that time whether, uh, whether I would still have God if I left the church. When you were expelled, uh, you were ostracized in a very immediate sense where 
members of your immediate family weren't even allowed to uh, talk to you. In my case, when I was in Scientology and I began to differ with the people around me and say that I wanted to leave, I was detained in one of the executive offices. The door was slammed. Two strong men were at the door and they were forbidding me to leave the room. I've been one of Jehovah's Witnesses for over 40 years. I served in the full-time ministry as a youth. I was one of the youngest ordained ministers with my own congregation at the age of 21. And I was invited to the world headquarters at that time and became a member of the headquarters staff in Brooklyn, New York. It was like expecting to see heaven and finding nothing but garbage. The immorality, the stealing, the lying, the ambitious pursuit of the ministry, the homosexuality that you couldn't get away from because they were all boys there. I saw young men wanting to commit suicide. Many that were having nervous breakdowns. And the thing that hurt me the most was to see young children, whole lives ruined. They were not encouraged to go into music or into the theater or into any pursuit other than serving the Watchtower organization. And then the reports that were coming in about the children dying because the society would not allow them to take blood transfusion. We looked upon Christmas and Easter and Mother's Day and all that as being of the demons. We were taught that voting was a sin. We were encouraged to become draft dodgers because we were taught we were not to support the nations. We were not to support the armies or the governments. We were told that we shouldn't even associate with our friends and relatives that were not Jehovah's Witnesses. It kept us completely away from the reality of what the world was. There was no way that I could get out of that oppression. I felt there was, there was no way that I could reach God. Every ambition I had was cut off. You don't even feel like a person anymore. You're told when to get up and when to walk and when to go to a meeting. You go to five meetings a week. Total obedience is what they ask, or you're put out as an apostate. It's the smoothest brainwashing mechanism in existence. I don't think anyone that has not been in a cult can exactly know what it's like to be programmed, to totally brainwashed and programmed, where you don't have an individual thought for yourself, you're not allowed to think. Uh, in, in, in essence, when you go to meetings, you're, you check your mind at the door. Most people think they're immune to brainwashing either because they think they're too stubborn or they think that their IQ is too high to be brainwashed or mind conditioned. I was a shattered, fragmented person as a result of that experience. Uh, totally unequipped to deal with, with life. So after I became aware of the degeneracy, the sexual degeneracy, the phoniness of what was going on inside people's temple, I left under the threat of death. But when I left People's Temple, I became aware that I had lost everything. I had lost my marriage, I'd lost my faith in God, I'd lost my faith in the United States government. And the only God I had left, socialism, Marxism, People's Temple, I'd lost that too. It was at the right time and the right hour that a young lady came to my home and shared with me the message of the gospel. She said, Robbie, God loves you and that Jesus Christ died on a cross to forgive you all your sins, and that God wants to come into your life, but he would only come through Jesus, who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father except through me. Well, I was quite shaken up, I, because I'd never heard this before. I never heard anything like this in Hinduism, that God loves me, or that a God died for my sins. Krishna in Hinduism said there are many ways. Buddha, before he died, said he hadn't found the way. And here was Jesus saying that he is the way. Jesus died and he was put in a tomb and three days later he was gone. And I thought, why didn't Krishna raise up or any of the spiritual masters? All of them have tombs over there in India where they died and left bodies behind. And it was like a light went on and I just realized that Jesus was God and that's what made him different. And that's why those guys weren't God. I realized that my search for God, which is what I was really on, could be fulfilled when I found Jesus as my Messiah and my Savior. I never would have needed to turn to the religions of the East if I had known that Jesus Christ was there knocking at the door of my heart. TM gave the sort of peace that one gets if he's anesthetized, but Jesus gives a real living peace. It has uh, made all the difference in my life. I had a talk with this man, and 
he first opened the Bible up and showed me in the scriptures everything that I was into, astrology, mediumistic experiences, talking about the future, giving psychic readings to people. He showed where this was totally an abomination to God. I had to decide whether I was going to follow Mary Baker Eddy and her teachings, a woman who now is dead for nearly a hundred years, or Jesus who came back from the dead and who is alive. It was through my wife's example that I came to know Jesus personally. I really think that if it hadn't been for her change, I would be like a lot of people are leaving Ambassador College, totally without God and without an interest in knowing God again. I had an attitude of just, you know, taking a sabbatical from God, from religion, from everything, because I was sick and tired of it. I had been lied to so much. I wanted to find out what was really true. And you know, I kept saying, there's something I'm looking for. What is it? Here we are, Jehovah's Witnesses all over the world. We're serving Jehovah God. Why is it I feel so lonely and empty? Forty years is a lifetime to many people. And when I found Christ Jesus, then I knew what it was all about. Then life became real to me. I finally did come back into a true knowledge of the real God, the personal God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So I took Larry and we went to a Christian church. The first night at the Christian church, they asked if anyone wanted to accept the Lord. And Larry said, yes, I have waited for this moment for a long time. The young man that introduced me to Christ is now my husband. And for the first time in my life, I realized that I was a sinner. There was no way that I could work my way to heaven. I realized that Jesus Christ cared about me that he knew my shoe size, that he knew every strand of hair on my head. One night I got down on my knees and I said, God, I believe I know you. If I don't know you, I want to know you. If you will come into my life, take my life, my marriage, straighten all of this mess out, it's yours. I didn't even realize what I'd done, but thank God I did it. <laughs> I'm so thankful that someone came to tell me that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from all sin and that one day back yonder, I trusted Christ as my Savior and asked him into my heart. Many people who are aware of my past, who know that I've uh, been involved in many different organizations and with many different isms, they ask me, well, how do you know that uh, getting involved in Christianity is not just another ism for you? I used to wonder, what was I going to teach my children? And how was I going to make sure that uh, they avoided the mistakes that I made in my own life? And I never really had an answer for those things before. But in Jesus Christ, we find that all questions have an answer. And not just an answer, but the answer. I saw Manson as Christ until I met the real Jesus. I finally went on my knees and prayed a very simple prayer asking Jesus Christ to forgive me all my sins and to come into my life and to bring me into contact with the true and living God. When I prayed that prayer, something radical happened to me. I literally felt tons and tons of dark things go out of me. And for the first time, I came to realize that all the mystical experiences that I had had, all the visions I saw and the mystical music I heard, all the astral projections, they were all part of the darkness that had gone out of me. And Jesus Christ, who said, I am the light of the world, entered my life. He completely changed me. He transformed me and made me into a brand new person. Ever since then, he's just been the light, the light of my life, the truth. And I've never felt, you know, the depression and just the deep despair and the confusion that I had so many nights when I was in that cult. People died for something they thought was a cause. I knew 700 at least of the 900 people that died. Those were people I would have given my life for, people I would have died for. I hope that the church in America won't sweep Jonestown under the carpet, that we won't forget the past, that we won't forget men like Jim Jones, and how they became that way. I can understand in many respects why people turn to cults. Because when I tried the traditional churches, 
there were no answers there. And going to church every Sunday is, was not filling the need in my life as much as, as good as there was. And I wanted my children to have Sunday school and a Christian education. However, I needed answers. I needed help. I was desperate. And I had to have answers. And the answer came in the discovery that it is possible to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I had never known that in my whole life. 